the whole first season, I watched Will and Grace, and he lied on the couch, and he had the, the paper like this the whole time, and he refused to watch. She's like, and now he walks around in the house going, just Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sam, and good evening, everyone. My name is Thane Rosenbaum, and welcome to the forum's phenomenally successful ongoing series, Trials and Error. For those who've been watching over the years, we've had um, the Bernard Getz case. Uh, we've done the O.J. Simpson case. That was wild, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it was just nuts. Uh, we had the Casey Anthony case. We did um, uh, Jordan Belfort, equally nuts. That was, <laughs> we, and then uh, what else did we do? Uh, we've done a few others, I think, that I can't remember. But tonight, uh, we have a very special case and very special guests. Uh, we're talking today about uh, the case uh, Hollingsworth versus Perry. For those of you who do or do not know, this was the case that uh, ruled that the statewide uh, uh, ballot initiative in California known as Proposition 8, which sought to ban same-sex marriage in the state of California as unconstitutional under both the Equal Protection Clause and the Due, due Process Clause. And so it was an incredibly important case, although it's not the case, and we're going to talk about it today, tonight, it's not the case that's actually before the Supreme Court. We're actually talking about a trial court opinion, uh, which we're going, to el we're going to animate and make it come real to you today, and in part because we're here uh, because of one of our guests has just written this really wonderful book, uh, Speak Now, uh, Marriage Equality on Trial, was just reviewed very favorably in the New York Times, the story of Hollingsworth versus uh, Perry, and my colleague and distinguished constitutional law professor at NYU, uh, Kenji Yoshino. <laughs> And one of my really good friends, who's now making her second appearance. Look, she's looking at, really? Yes, it's your second appearance at the forum uh, uh, years yes, ago. Yes, you are his friend. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, which was it that troubled you? <laughs> Dahlia Lithwick, who you may know for years, has been covering uh, legal affairs for Slate. She also has an incredibly entertaining podcast called Amicus. I was on it last week, so it's really fun. And so please welcome Dahlia Lithwick. And of course, last but not least, the lovely and always interesting Deborah Messing, who many, many people know as the Emmy-winning actress for Will and & Grace. And there's clearly a connection between Will and & Grace and all of these cases that's come before all of these courts. And we're gonna talk about that today because I wonder how important, pivotal, the show was in, in, in humanizing the face of same-sex marriage and gay lifestyle, and I think that there, you know, there's an award that should have been given just for that. Mm -hmm. I'm sure it happened, but it should have been. But she's an Emmy Award-winning actress. You can see her now, and I understand you've just been picked up for a second year, The Mysteries of Laura from NBC. <laughs> and I must say, guilty pleasure, I was a fan of Smash. Ah, oh, thank you. I know, I... I <laughs> I was a, yes. And I was particularly a fan of the part that you played in Smash Thank because you. I know we're, <laughs> having, we're having a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I love that show, and I'm so glad that, you, that we still have Mysteries of Lore, many more episodes, and best wishes to you. So Thank the lovely you. Deborah Messing. And so we have a lot to talk about, a lot of fun things to say, and I thought we would start uh, with a clip from Will and Grace. <laughs> something that really doesn't make sense mm -hmm. about network television that goes on for years and years and years and years. And so at the time, we all were in agreement. We thought, you know what, we've done our best work. And now we, we fear that we're going to start just sort of repeating ourselves. And we want to go out, you know, with, with people feeling good about, about what we've done. And, um, but selfishly, you know, I miss going to work and laughing every single day. I mean, that, that was one of the extraordinary blessings of, of being on that set. Now, the show, the producers, you as an actress, you must have received over the years, eight years, male people on the street saying, you have made my life much easier, right? There must be incredible anecdotal evidence that Will and Grace had a huge effect on not just the transformation of the culture, the broader culture, but on gay lifestyle itself in what you just saw, the experience of coming out. 
Yeah, it, it was it was really um, <coughs> shocking and overwhelming and um, humbling because, you know, we knew we were doing something something potent when we were starting this show at that time. Ellen's show was canceled after she came out, um, and there was open concern by the network at that point that you know we can't be too gay. And, and they actually phrased it just like they that. They said, you can, yes, no, they said, if, if you go back and you, and you look at the pilot, 30% of the people who were um, asked after the fact did not realize that Will was gay after watching the pilot. Wow. And that was by design. Um, of course, I'm like, wait a minute, we're talking about George Clooney. You know, how could you not, how can you not get that? But, um, you know, the, the, the whole point was, you know, let's, let's, there's a trepidation here because we know this can be special and important. And so let's take it slowly and let's make everybody start to fall in love with these characters. And then we'll be able to do anything mm -hmm. and everything. And um, the letters certainly came pouring in. And, you know, they, they were, you know, the, the most moving um, declarations of, of gratitude. Um, you know, stories about, because of the show, I'm a, I was able to come out to my best friend and I thought my best friend was never gonna talk to me again and, and he's fine with it. Or, you know, my mother and I watch it together and she's never really been okay and now we're laughing together and it's helping us heal. And, mm -hmm. I, letter from a priest, letter, I mean, letters from all over. And, um, and it's, again, saying thank you for helping me rethink something that I thought I would never rethink. Well, I mean, they said I've never been represented on, on television, mm -hmm. period. You know, up until that point, you know, there, there was so Billy Crystal. Oh, I'm sorry, I miscon So the priest was gay. Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. I thought you had changed his no, view. No, no. Okay. All right, no. so right, okay. But that, that came with time. That, yeah. that priest letter was the first season. Wow. You know, which I thought was pretty brave. An incredible accomplishment. Yeah. Right, that the show could do that. Yes, but certainly over, over the years, you know, the, it, it, it made a dialogue come to life and made it possible to, to really discuss, you know, what's acceptable in our society and what does love mean and mm. what does acceptance mean. And, um, you know, I think it's it's the source of the greatest, my greatest pride. You know, not so much the success of the show, but the social and political impact. Because it clearly transcended the pure sitcom format. Yes. yes. So, Kenji, speaking of culture, uh, the book is wonderful. Uh, but one of the things you say in the book about you call it the story of Hollingsworth versus Perry, and it's intentional. Because to you, that case, reading the court transcript, which most people would say would be an incredibly dry experience for you, it was you know, teeming with life. It was almost novelistic. And so you see the trial uh, of Hollingsworth versus Perry almost like its own novel, its own, own story. So tell us, you know, you're a law professor. We don't normally think of someone like you seeing the pure life of this story because that's not what you imagine law professors to do. But in your case, this novel is, uh, this book is really looking at this case as if it was a novel because it's filled with so much human drama. So tell us a little about your thinking and way you, the way you followed Hollingsworth versus Perry. Yes, I, I'd love to say, and uh, I'd like to start, though, by saying that another thing that might feel unconventional to hear coming out of the lips of a constitutional law professor is what an enormous fan I am of, of Deborah. <laughs> <laughs> and as well as I know the Constitution, which I've taught for 15 years, I know Will and Grace better. <laughs> uh, that to you? I know that I've not seen, I didn't, Thane did not tell me which clips he was going to play, but I know that Will tried to uh, pretend that he was aroused when you were in bed by looking at a poster of Kevin Bacon. Yeah. 
So if that's not granular knowledge, <laughs> too much information, I don't know what it is. Um, but in all seriousness, I just want to open by thanking you because I haven't had the chance to do that face to face. I'm, Vice President Biden said, as important as Lawrence versus Texas, which was our Brown versus Board of Education was, uh, was not as important as Will and Grace. So you've done more for the civil rights movement than I think that you know anyone in this audience could even imagine, and certainly any lawyer could imagine doing. So thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, having opened with that, uh, Thane was, was very kind to say that uh, you know, I, I approach the law as a, as a story and I take that as a high compliment. We have three former English majors and one former theater major on the stage, so uh, you know, I, I really view myself as, as never having left my um, literary roots behind. And when I picked up this transcript, which uh, came to my attention because there was a landmark opinion that was 136 pages long, 80 findings of fact by Chief Judge Von Walker. This is a district court judge, uh, the first federal trial on same-sex marriage that had gone on for 12 days. As soon as I read the opinion, I said to my librarian, please get me the transcript of this case. And she had to lug up all 13 <laughs> volumes of the case. And I started reading on page one. And uh, my husband, who was sitting in the audience, who might also like to recognize, Ron Stoneham, uh, Thank you. Um, can attest to this. I started reading on page one, and I didn't sort of surface into everyday life again until I had turned the last page. Because for me, this was like a shining civil rights document. So it wasn't will and grace, right? <laughs> but within what we can accomplish within law, it was the best conversation that we'd ever had uh, about same-sex marriage because it was rigorous, it was thorough, and it had a deep humanity to it uh, that was just profoundly moving. And so the thing that was heartbreaking for me was that they had barred cameras from the courtroom. So I thought if there's one thing I can do that would be useful to the world, it would be to bring this trial to the reader. If I could hand, with my skills, you know, if I could hand you know, one document over to uh, an individual who's on the fence or undecided, either in this country or in one of the 200 nations in the world that do not yet have uh, manage marriage equality, it would be this uh, trial transcript. And given that no one's gonna read a 3,000 page trial transcript, I tried to distill into a book as, as best as I could. Mm -hmm. um, Dahlia, just for those here who are civilians, which many of them are, uh, by the way, we are offering CLE credit, which is for people who are lawyers, but what Jennifer didn't mention, I guess you can still get CLE credit if you're not a lawyer, you know, in case you ever want to go to law school. You can, <laughs> yes! You, you can, <laughs> what do you mean? I've already got CLE credit. I saw Deborah Messing. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Uh, Help us understand the difference, the relationship between this case, which is what we're discussing today, and the case that's coming out in the Supreme Court next month. Because I think it is confusing, right? There was the Doma-Windsor case, and then there was Perry, and those cases came out at the same day. They right. were announced on the same day, or roughly the same day, certainly the same term. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it seemed as if, okay, well, we overturned this you know, ban in, in Proposition 8, and, let, and then you started seeing more states uh, 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 enacting their own laws uh, permitting uh, same-sex marriage. Uh, so what's this? What's coming up in June? So, so I mean, one thing that's really interesting was that there were two cases at, happening at the same time. And Windsor is the one we all think of because Edie Windsor, there was this tremendous story of this woman in New York and um, you know, watching her on, on the steps in front of the court was very, very powerful. And that was sort of a solid win, right? That was, was taking out the heart of DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. And I think that got a lot of attention at the time. Perry, the way it was decided, it was decided very Bush v. Gorish, right? It was a uh, good for one ride only. You know, it, it's you know we're gonna we're gonna say that the ban in California goes down, but only because of the very fact specific context of what happened in California. So Perry doesn't go on to sort of stand for I think what uh, Holly uh, what Windsor uh, stands for, and yet in neither situation the court given the option to pull the trigger and just do it, the court doesn't do it. You mean? offering, enacting a broad constitutional right. Right. right? The Supreme Same. Court says, this is it, live with it. We're These gonna, bans this. are unconstitutional right. and they're done. And so so the in court, both instances, they chose not to do They chose not, they, so they sort of ducked it <clears throat> on this standing problem in, 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 um, in Perry and in uh, 
Windsor, they limited it to the Defense of Marriage Act. Now, what they did was they set up the next uh, challenge. And everyone and in the law knew this. Everybody right? knew it was coming, and I think we didn't think it was coming this quickly. I think we thought it was a longer time frame. But the person we, you know, must thank is Antonin Scalia, who pretty much, you know, in his dissent said, "Here's what's going to happen next." And then every single reviewing court said, "What Justice Scalia said. <laughs> Here's what's going to happen next." And they <laughs> used his dissent as the template for the argument for striking down these state bans. And so almost immediately after Perry and after uh, Windsor, you just see boom, 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 state after state that's reviewing it, striking down the bans using the logic of Perry, using the logic of the DOMA case, even though the court didn't say it stood for that proposition. So you have district courts around the country just swinging for the fences, saying, I'm going to write what Justice Kennedy was afraid to write in those decisions. And then the court basically was stuck with a whole pile of states that had now said these bans are unconstitutional, citing the court that hadn't said it. <laughs> and then the court really was faced with, finally, they got a case where there was a ban that was upheld. And the justices were like, now we really have to do it. And now they're really going to do it. I mean, they're going to do something. But they, they can't duck it. I want to say that Justice Scalia's reaction to the majority opinion in Hollingsworth versus Perry was very similar to Grace's reaction to Will saying that he was gay. <laughs> How was his hair? <laughs> it's sticking up about as much. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, Justice Scalia is from Queens, so we do. Own, we are, he's from our world, but he's a little more conservative than anyone on this stage. Uh, just saying. I just as a guest. I, I last year we had, um, or was it two years ago? We had. Justice Sotomayor on stage, oh. sitting right there. And wow. we, we talked about how all it was, the Supreme Court is now filled with New Yorkers, <laughs> and then there's Scalia. <laughs> we, just, we don't know if we can claim him, but yes, he's from Queens. Uh, which you kind of love, right? Given the case, all right, whatever, Queens. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure he never thought of it that way. Nor, nor is, thanks, Deborah. That was great. It took me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> so um, tell us, and this is important because I think that, Kenji, you would say, well, this is what Perry was all about. Does it answer a question that many people would want to know? Well, why is marriage so important? Well, you know, I remember years ago uh, reading that, uh, I think it was in, in some march in France, that um, who's the designer for uh, uh, Lagerfeld for Chanel? Carl Lagerfeld. Carl Lagerfeld, who's openly gay had said something like, well, I'll march with you, but I'm against it because I'm against marriage. I don't think marriage is important. It's not about, you know, I want rights for gays, but I just think this is so trivial. He thought it was trivial, but obviously the people in Perry didn't think it was trivial. Uh, the plaintiffs, there were two sets of plaintiffs who were the named plaintiffs, who were interesting people that you discussed. Uh, so tell us, what is it about marriage that really we should, that triggers a fundamental constitutional right like other constitutional rights? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, uh, you know, I want to emphasize that I am for the right to marriage, uh, but like Karl Lagerfeld, I'm not uh, a fascist about this idea of everyone should have to get married, so people should have the choice regardless of whether they're straight or gay. Uh, I think the plaintiffs put it the best when they took the stand on the first day and talked about what marriage might mean to them. And uh, what they said was, you know, we've been told since we were children that uh, marriage is the happy end to uh, every tale. Mm -hmm. And so if we're denied that happy ending, uh, then it's really hard for us to imagine our way into the future. Mm -hmm. And it was really a beautiful and selfless quote. You know, all four of these plaintiffs are just dazzlingly uh, humane and other regarding people because uh, it takes such an amount of, of stamina uh, to um, go through one of these cases. Uh, but one of the female plaintiffs, uh, Chris Perry, said, uh, you know, Chris and I, or Sandy and I, her, her now wife and she, uh, are big, strong women. So this may not make a big difference to us. But I think about the kids who were mm -hmm. once like me growing up in Bakersfield, California right now. And if they can't imagine themselves forward into that happy ending, uh, that's actually putting them in danger, right? Because if you can't imagine yourself into adulthood, mm -hmm. then what do you imagine yourself mm -hmm. into? Excellent. Mr. Constitutional Law Professor, one other question, just briefly. Uh, 
The people of California, a majority of them in Proposition 8, through an act of direct democracy, voted to uh, uh, ban uh, same-sex marriage. 52%, I think, was the number. Exactly. Explain to us, as a constitutional law professor, why do courts have the right to trump the interests and the desires of a majority? I mean, the, the state went to the trouble of, of having an election. They had a referendum. Absolutely. Uh, why? I mean, it, I think it's confusing for some people. We understand there are separation of powers, mm -hmm. but in this instance, why does the federal judge, Walker, get to trump the interests of 52% of Californians who took the time to get in their car and go and vote? Great. Uh, so I think there, there are really two answers to that. I mean, one is that we don't live in a pure democracy. We live in a constitutional democracy. So there are certain things that we don't put up for a vote, and our constitutional rights, our fundamental rights, are one of those things that are not put up for a vote. Mm -hmm. The right to marry is a fundamental right, you know, and the right to be treated equally is a fundamental right. Mm -hmm. And so both of those things are proper limitations that we can place in the democratic process. So that's a sort of first cut answer that any constitutional law professor would give. I think there's a more particular reason. I'm, I love the fact that you brought up the referendum thing because there's a particular problem also with referenda, where if, if we look at the history of referenda, there is often a very toxic kind of confluence of religion and referenda. And this is not anything against people of faith. I have great respect for uh, people of faith. But the problem is that referenda are a mechanism for people of faith to vote their convictions into law in a way that doesn't end run around the Establishment Clause. So the Establishment Clause says you cannot base a secular law based on your religious beliefs. But in a direct democracy, who is to police that? Because all these individuals, whether religious or otherwise, are going into the closet of the voting booth, if you will, hmm. and voting their preferences and what emerges as a law. And the court can't really police whether or not those laws are being enacted based on people's religious beliefs or not in the way that it would if there were a legislative record or a legislative history to look at. And so time and time again, we've seen in 31 states now, religious majorities enacting their religious beliefs into law through the referendum process. Hmm. So what, what could otherwise not be achieved in a court can be circumvented through direct democracy. Exactly, and one of the polling uh, pieces of uh, polling data that came out in the trial actually was that 84% of people who attended church regularly right, voted yes on Prop 8, hmm. and 83% of people who did not go to church voted no. Huh. So there was a very, very it high lines up. Yeah. It lines up. Um, Dahlia, the, speaking of the drama of this case, one piece that must have been irresistible for journalists like you was that the lawyers representing the plaintiffs who were seeking to overturn Proposition 8 were the very same lawyers that faced off against each other in Bush v. Gore. One, a former Ted Olson, once a former solicitor general, very much identified with conservatives. Uh, who on this issue truly embraced his adversary, David Boyce, and it was two high-powered superstar corporate lawyers, not the movement lawyers, but corporate lawyers, who led the charge in this case. There must have been, you must have written about that all the time. It, it, it said, and Kenji treats it so well in the book because it's just really important to be honest about the fact that the movement lawyers did not support this initially. I think Kenji's pretty open about the fact that he was leery of this piece of litigation. The movement had, you need to understand, the movement had a brick by brick plan, and this was not the plan. This was way ahead of the plan, and it looked as though these two superstars with egos the size of Cleveland were helicoptering in to save the day. <laughs> they didn't have civil rights backgrounds, and I think it made people very anxious. But you're quite right, in addition to, so we, we really did see this fracture of you know, all the movement lawyers, the folks at the groups who for years and years had strategized how this is gonna go and watching them go, oh my God, these lunatics are gonna come in and screw it all up and it's gonna go back to Bowers versus Hardwick, right? It's gonna go back to uh, you know, the, uh, the Supreme Court. There's no way around that and the Supreme Court is gonna smack us down. They were terrified. But I think you're quite right. The symbolism of having the two people, I mean, I was in the courtroom when they argued Bush v. Gore at the Supreme Court 
And you could not have constructed in an underground lab two more different people <laughs> than Ted Olson and David Boyce. Mm -hmm. And to see them come together and say, you know, Ted Olson is, is sort of the godfather of, of you know, the sort of, uh, 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 sort of, I think you describe it as the, the you know, the vast right wing conspiracy that went after Hillary. Like that was happening. I think again. he goes hunting with Justice Scalia. Yeah, no, I mean he is a. If he doesn't. A, he should. He is without a doubt yeah. has the bona fides of you know the movement yeah. conservative. And for him to come round and and Kenji's careful to sort of trace this to his libertarian roots and his sense of just fundamental justice and fairness. But for Ted and you know and, and David to come together and say this is just wrong. I think the symbolic value was absolutely explosive. I mean, you really couldn't imagine an analog. I certainly hadn't seen one. And what's also interesting, another irony, is that neither of these lawyers would have wanted it to go to trial, right? The very thing that Kenji wrote a book about, I'm not sure there would have been a book in you had you not read the transcript of the story of the people who were in this trial, right? The testimony, the rigorous examination of the facts and the evidence. The, the lawyers actually wanted to make an expeditious uh, uh, speed over to the Supreme Court. They didn't want to undertake the ongoing painstaking uh, experience of going through an actual trial. Uh, and yet the romance, as you would say, of this case was the trial, not the appeal. Exactly. And going back to what Dolly was saying earlier, uh, you know, if anything you understood, I was having sort of help palpitations, you know, when the case was filed because, I mean, this has happened so quickly that I think it's good to have a refresher. Like when this case was filed in 2009, there were only four states that had same-sex marriage and the Supreme Court very rarely treads that far ahead of public opinion. And so it was a terrifying thing for uh, gay individuals, for people who are involved in the movement to watch this case, you know, rocketing to the Supreme Court. So for me, it was really reading the trial that changed my mind, that I read the shining civil rights document and I thought for this I can forgive anything, right? And, but then I did about 40 interviews for this book and then Ted and David are just so unbelievably uh, charming. So uh, they finish each other's sentences and I said at one point, like, how can you get along so well when you are on the opposite sides of you know, such a major issue? David once said, you know, many lawyers whose cases I lost an entire country to Ted Olson right, <laughs> over Bush versus Gore. And his response was fascinating because he said, you know, you get so deep as a lawyer into a case that the only person who understands it at the level of specificity that you do is your party opposite, mm -hmm. right? And so Ted was the only person, long after my spouse had stopped talking to me about this, like <laughs> Ted would still talk to me about like the intricacies <laughs> of this case and was still just as interested as I was because his spouse had stopped talking to him about his side of the case. And so they really just got uh, to be very, very close friends uh, through this. And I think exactly as you said, Dahlia, when they came together, it was as if the two halves of the country were being knit together again. Right? And so it showed that this was not only a bar bipartisan issue, but a nonpartisan issue. It was a, about universal human flourishing. It wasn't an issue of the right or of the left. No, it's a very powerful, symbolic idea that they did come together. What do you think about the idea that uh, Judge Walker wanted to televise the, uh, the trial? To it, I think he wanted to televise, it wasn't broadly, he wanted to televise it to five other courtrooms. And YouTube, I think. And YouTube. Right? Wasn't so right? everyone would have had a chance to see it. And then ultimately, the Supreme Court ruled that he could not, right? That was, that's how it ended up. It's interesting, Dahl, you and I had on your podcast, we talked about this last week in your last show. And I mentioned on the show that when we had Justice Sotomayor uh, here a couple years ago, I asked her, I said, you know, when you were going on the bench, you were very openly in favor of televising Supreme Court oral arguments. But you now recently changed. And she said, I said, so how come? And she said, well, you know, the real problem is that oral arguments are so uh, uh, technical and narrow in scope that I'm not sure people would have understood what they're looking at. But that's not true of a trial, right? I mean, even if you don't, even if you don't accept that, if you say, look, I still want to see a right. boring oral argument, even if I don't understand anything as a citizen, I have the right to mm -hmm. see it. I can't get tickets to go in, but at least for the love of God, let me watch it. Uh, but a trial, right, with all the humanity that you're describing why not show this? 
Yeah, it's, I mean, I'm not even gonna try to answer that question because I'm a big fan of you know, cameras in the courtroom. Uh, what I will say though is that it had a kind of uh, perverse effect. Uh, I think of it sort of like uh, Lady Chatterley's Lover because I'm not sure any of us would think that Lady Chatterley's Lover was such a great novel or even read it <laughs> if it hadn't been censored and banned and we were told that we couldn't read it. So in reaction to being told, you know, you cannot look at this trial, Lance Black, you know, wrote the play yeah, eight, eight, which has now had 900,000 views on YouTube. You know, there have been three books, including my own, that is have that, been written on this trial. Right. That's, that's the one with Brad Pitt playing Judge Walker. Exactly. How Which flattering! You, how flattering for Judge Walker. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, he is—he's not insensible to the honor. Yeah. Uh, uh, um, but um, yeah, it was—it was just such a powerful um, drama, and you know, just to you know, give people a flavor of of what happened uh, in the in the courtroom. You know, on day six of the trial, there's a young man, just a 26-year-old man, who says that he was a glorified secretary for the um, Colorado Police Department. So you're kind of scratching your head thinking, why is this person testifying? And he was testifying as a lay witness to the immutability of sexual orientation, which is one of the factors a court looks at to determine whether or not a group is a protected class under the Equal Protection Clause, which is the home of the equality principle in the Constitution under the 14th Amendment. And he said that when he came out to his parents, his mother said to him, herself uh, a very evangelical, devout uh, Christian, that she would rather have had an abortion than have had a gay son. Oh God. And he was so traumatized by this that he uh, agreed to go into conversion therapy at the behest of his parents and went through two different conversion therapists, realized that he was never gonna change, that if he was truly gonna extinguish his sexual orientation and his homosexuality, that he would have to extinguish himself. He became suicidal, uh, emancipated himself from his parents, and went into a spiral of drug abuse and homelessness, right? So you have that testimony, and I think that all of us can feel the tug of that testimony and think about how much more powerful that is than someone just saying in the abstract, I have all these studies that show that sexual orientation is immutable. Right. But the thing that was so wonderful about this trial was that it didn't leave it just at the story, because I think that even though we all assimilate information through stories, there's still that nagging voice in the back of our head that says, I can't create policy for 300 million Americans on the basis of one moving story, no matter how powerful it is. So show me that the story is representative. So two days later, on day eight of the trial, they have a social psychologist come in named Gregory Herrick, equally heroic in my mind, had spent th three decades of his life uh, studying the specific issue of immutability. And he said 92% of individuals can't change their sexual orientation. So without Ryan Kendall's testimony, I think Gregory Herrick's testimony would have been too dry. But without Gregory Herrick's testimony, I think Ryan Kendall's testimony would have been deemed to be too idiosyncratic. And so it was a yoking together uh, that happened over and over again uh, in this trial of narrative compassion and statistical compassion that made it such a powerful document for me. But, but and, I, and, oh, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I just wanna, I, I, I was incensed when, when the Supreme Court, you know, in an unsigned per curiam opinion said, you know, the US Supreme Court pulled the plug on the trial. It was not, um, and, and I was incensed partly because I think they gave great weight to this narrative that, oh, because you know the people who were gonna testify on behalf of the proponents of Prop 8, they're being bullied and they're being harassed. And I think when the court put its imprimatur on the idea that Prop 8 supporters were you know, having their mailboxes vandalized and being tortured, I think that was a really dangerous thing. And I actually think that's kind of the, the kernel of the thing we, na we now see in a lot of these religious freedom arguments, you know, that, 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 that the, that, that, that the same-sex marriage community, they're the haters and they're the bullies and that, you know, we who just want to um, preserve marriage, we're the victims. And, I, and, and it did upset me that that sort of leaked into the court, uh, into the opinion, and I think has leaked into the discourse around it. And the other thing, I, I just to, 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 to sort of put a gloss on what Kenji's saying, and it goes back to, to, to Deborah, is I just think like having faces, really seeing a face is so powerful. And even if it's like Will, we all know Will. We know that guy. And I just think when I think about um, the justices of the US Supreme Court, you know, I'm thinking of Lewis Powell, I guess, who, who said, I never knew anyone gay. And he did. He had a gay clerk who was 
who never came out to him, I guess. But I just think you have to have that connection. Mm -hmm. And in my view, not just as a journalist, but as a human being, I think absent those faces, uh, you know, it's, it's with, with all due respect, because the book is insane, but I think absent the faces and seeing that testimony. Insanely good, insanely yes. bad. Insanely, insane. insanely <laughs> awesome. Uh, Sorry. Yes, insane in the way you want to hear. Insane in the best possible way, but I, I just, I, I do feel that there's a massive cost to pulling the plug on the television uh, um, rendition of what Kenji's described. Now, just to make everyone feel better, I can't resist asking you to finish the story about Kendall Bryant. Yeah, so this is such a... Well, here's our suicidal friend, yeah. and, but there, it gets better. Yeah, so uh, in the book, I talk about how they prepped him for trial, and they treated him with kid gloves because they were worried about re-traumatizing him. And uh, it wasn't working because he had so uh, dissociated himself from his experiences that he was telling the story as if it had happened to somebody else. Yeah. So as an actress, you know, mm -hmm. I, I think that you, or as an actor, you must um, uh, relate to this. Uh, and so finally, Molly Lee, one of my former students actually said, I am going to just cross-examine you like um, David Boyes. Uh, and so we're gonna rehearse this really differently, the gloves come off. And she broke through uh, and just asked him rat-a-tat-tat questions. And he finally told it in the first person and broke down in tears. And that's how he testified uh, on the stand. And even when he was recounting this to me, he said, uh, I realized that this had happened to me. This is from uh, my interview with him. I realized that this terrible thing had happened to uh, this person and that it had th this horrific impact on this person. Mm. And then I realized that this person was me. Oh my God. So even across the course of that one sentence, you hear the movement from the third person to the first person where he's actually inhabiting it. And the tragedy is that, you know, and this is why those of you who are lawyers in the audience, I guess all of us who are lawyers uh, in the room need to be mindful of the way we treat witnesses, is that he was re-traumatized. He said, I went from talking to the smartest people in the legal profession on day one, and then the next day, day two, I was back in Denver entering pawn tickets for the police department, and I just kept reprocessing my testimony, and I became so re-traumatized that I decided that I was gonna kill myself. Oh, God. And the one thing that saved him was, again, his selflessness, because his sister was about to take the bar exam. And so he didn't want to throw off her performance. So he said, I'm going to wait until you've taken the bar exam. Meaning, I'm not going to kill myself until you pass the bar. Correct. Right? And in that interim, thank God, one of the lawyers called him and said, you know, we need to check up on you as part of our ethical obligation. You know, how are you doing? And he said, not well. And they were horrified, and they said, what can we do to help? And this is the happy sequel, which actually happened since the book, so it's not in the book. Uh, they said, what can we do for you? Uh, and he said, well, I want to actually grow up to be a civil rights lawyer, <laughs> right? Uh, but I don't even have my high school degree. Uh, and so they said, we will help you. They got him his GED, right? So this trial happens in 2010. So, you know, in about 2011, 2012, he gets his GED. He applies to two colleges, right? Uh, Columbia and University of Colorado. Gets into Columbia, doesn't get into University of Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Graduates summa cum laude from oh. Columbia University, right? And this is a part that's not in the book because it's so recent. It's gonna start this fall as a law student at the University of California at Los Angeles. Awesome. <laughs> and for those of you who are not lawyers, that has the best uh, LGBT rights program in the country. So he's indeed going to become a uh, gay rights mm. lawyer um, in the future. Let's, uh, let's look at another clip from Will and Grace. Oh, this is actually one of my favorite scenes. <laughs> so, Deborah, you know I'm, you're one of my favorite actresses. This, you, this, everyone knows this. I see, I've seen The Wedding Date. I've seen... I didn't know that. Thank oh, you. yeah. Didn't I? <laughs> I've, you saw some of those sitcoms oh, that you did before <laughs> Wedding Date. So I've seen everything. I know that you were on, uh, what was it, uh, the, not Law and Order, the, weren't you a cop? You don't love me. Yeah. <laughs> what is it, not what that? SVU? No, you were on that, but even earlier. Oh, what, oh, NYPD Blue. NYPD Blue, that's a very, very yes. young Deborah Messing. Yes, yes. So now, so I've, I've, I've proven my Deborah Messing gravitas fanhood, <laughs> but could, could Will and Grace be, could it have been Will and Jack? Was America, no. Could it have been possible for no. there to be two gay men 
like The Odd Couple, uh, about two gay men who were living together. It, it needed Deborah Messing, right? Well, that can happen now. But not then. And it should happen now. Um, but no, it, it couldn't have happened then. Um, there, there, there had to be someone at the center who society could relate to, this straight woman, um, and, and see, see Will through her eyes and fall in love with Will the way Grace loved him and respected him and honored him and you know, and it, that had to happen because if it, if it was if it was two gay characters, all of Middle of America would have they wouldn't even watched. One of one of my favorite encounters. I was in um, Chicago airport, and this woman came up to me. She was in her 60s, and she said, um, "This was while I was on the show." She said, "Oh my God, I love your show. I love your show." And I was like, "Fantastic!" And she goes, "Okay, my husband hates gays," <laughs> and I was like, "Oh." And she said, hates. <laughs> and I said, I got it, <laughs> OK? And she said, but the whole first season, I watched Will and Grace. And he lied on the couch. And he had the, the paper like this the whole time. And he refused to watch. She's like, and now he walks around in the house going, just Jack. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, that person behind that newspaper would never, ever have, have even allowed themselves to enjoy the comedy of this community of people because it was, it was just too, it, it, was, it was too scary. So America needed to buy into Grace first before they could buy into Will and Grace. Right? Yes. They had to be able to see Grace and if Grace is okay with this and she loves these people, then yes. I can too. Yes. Um, you know, just for a little bit of cultural history, since we're the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society, uh, a show that I really liked in uh, back in the days when I was a lawyer many years ago, Thirty uh, Something. Oh yeah. In 1989, there was an episode in which two gay men were in bed, uh, and apparently, I don't know very much about this, but sponsors withdrew from the show. There was an amazing backlash. It was a very critically acclaimed show. I don't think it lasted more than three years, but it critically, and everyone, the people who loved it really loved yes. the show. But that episode just really was too early, right? Mm -hmm. uh, 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 Ellen DeGeneres is on the cover of Time Magazine in 1997. Uh, yes, now we know that, you know, we've seen Philadelphia, Brokeback Mountain. Right. Those, sh those movies may have come up, I'm not sure, during the era of Will and Grace. Um, so t d is this a slow cultural transformation? I mean, are, is anyone here surprised that it took that long? Uh, do people credit? I mean, I know Joe Biden credited Will and Grace. Did Will and Grace make it possible to watch Philadelphia or watch Brokeback Mountain in a way that everyone could embrace these stories in a way they might never have, right? Let me just ask this question. Did anyone, did, were any sponsors withdrawing their support from Will and Grace in year two when it became more avowedly gay? It, it was, um, I wasn't uh, a part of, you know, th those kind of conversations. But what I, what I do know is that it was a huge deal when Will kissed Jack on the Today Show, on our show. And it was something that Eric McCormack fought for. Hmm. Because at the time, I don't know, and I think it was because of sponsors. Um, they said, you know what? You can say all of these, these things that are, that are obvious jokes about gay people in, in your clever way of sort of hiding it mm -hmm. and saying it in you know, funny ways but we cannot see two men's lips touching. Mm -hmm. And it didn't happen. And, and finally, it, finally, it did. And, but it had to happen as a gotcha. We did it on national, te uh, national television on the Today Show. Right. It couldn't be. On the show itself. On the show, it couldn't, it couldn't be two men falling in love <laughs> and, and experiencing just a beautiful, tender moment at that point. Does it help that it was a comedy? And Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, 
you know, you watch Sean Hayes, and he's a he's a comic genius, and it's 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 you marvel at what he is able to do, and you fall in love with him, and he's the flamboyant character on the show, and um, I I think I think comedy. Comedy can make anything palatable. And so, do we? I don't even know. We have Modern Family, and it's another comedy. Right. Would be to just. Do you think we would be ready for a, a, a f an all-out drama that is really about the idea of of, of same-sex marriage? Can America? I mean, how gradual, how incremental do we accept things culturally? You know. In, in well, on Modern Family, they got married. That's true. They did. But again, comedy. Comedy. I mean, you know, there was the, the L word. Yeah. And, you know, that, but that was a cable show. Yeah. You know, again, it's, it's about, you know, trying to get it to the masses and making it just the norm. Right. It's so interesting to think about what needs to be, happen, right? Yes. It needs to be a comedy. It needs to have Sean Hay, you know, it has to have certain. I mean, certain it's, it's interesting that, that to you both, you're, you, it, it happens so quickly where we are now with the Supreme Court. Um, but I remember when Prop 8 was coming, you know, up for a vote and the Will and Grace cast did a public service announcement, um, you know, saying, you know, please, get out and vote. And you know, we were very clear about the side that we were on. And at the time, NBC said, it has to be made clear that this is not an NBC-sponsored PSA, right. mm -hmm. that this is an individual, private, privately funded, it is a, it is a personal choice, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with the network. And you know, obviously, we lost, it was 52%. We lost, and it was devastating. And it feels to me like it's taken forever since then to get here. Um, maybe I'm just naive and I don't understand how, you know, the legal system works and how... Uh, Did the writers propose at any point a same-sex marriage? I don't think so. Even, even though it was alive in the culture, Right, it couldn't. It was still. I think was a I know they talked in about the it. The show, though, right when Larry yes. and Larry. Yeah, yes, Larry. Yes, I feel like I should do a victory. Larry, line yes, you did. you did. You did. You just won it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and they had a baby. You know, he's not yeah. telling. He's not really a law professor. <laughs> <laughs> he really writes for TV shows. He's just. Exactly. He just knows everything about everything. <laughs> is really what we're learning. That was good way to pull that off. Yes, but Larry, that's right. They they got married. I right. feel my crowd with my students rising. <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. right, they got married. But can yeah. I just suggest, I find it so interesting that, that Thane, you're suggesting that, that marriage would be the controversial thing. Because I think one of the things Kenji does in the book and that's really clear is that marriage is a way of making this about families and children. Right. And the one thing we know for sure, if you think back to you know, how they packaged Lawrence versus Texas, which was the really, I think, the foundation for then what becomes Perry and what becomes Doma and what's gonna become Obergfell, hopefully. Um, wow, I just betrayed my feelings about this case. Um, <laughs> so, but, but I think that, that you know, when you look at Lawrence, Lawrence was a, a case in 2003 that was about same-sex sodomy between two men who were not married. And it was packaged in such a way, and Dale Carpenter, who you write about, did this incredible book about how it had to be kind of packaged to the Supreme Court to make it about love and intimacy and, and, and family. Because the word sodomy children. is just exactly. terrible. Exactly. So it seems to me that, that <laughs> marriage it's, is It's the, biblical. It's just biblical it's and biblical. terrible. Yes. But that is what I, it's true. I'm not packaging marriage as it's a problem. One wonders, given what you said, and Kenji talks about this, it marriage, and when you think about coupledom, when you think about people sharing uh, bonds in, in, in true sense of love and commitment and devotion to each other, and a devotion and commitment to raising children, marriage shouldn't scare anyone away, right? And yet this scared people away, that we're even still talking about, oh boy, same-sex marriage is too much for America. And yet in Lawrence, right, you, you we're talking about sodomy that needed to be repackaged. You would think that same-sex marriage wouldn't need much because it's right. just so obvious. Right. One of the things that you say that I thought was hilarious that I can't resist when, you talk, when it comes to the issue of, um, I forgot what the term of art was, not animus, uh, but you know the prejudice, the harm that's done uh, to marriage 
through same-sex marriage. The deinstitutionalization. Right, the deinstitutionalization. Yeah. Or maybe it was one of the other arguments you point out saying, or that, it, oh, the, the ongoing argument about what's best for the children, right, that we have families that are better in, in uh, opposite sex households. And you say, well, lawyers have a disproportionate amount of depression and suicide as a career. And no one ever says, well, you can't have children to lawyers. We never, and they're even allowed to marry other lawyers. And they can even marry, <laughs> which doubles, Disastrous. doubles yeah. down on That's depression. Right. That's right. And yet no one would say to two lawyers, I'm sorry, we can't let, that. We the best interest of the child is for you not to have children at all. Right. <laughs> Just do something else. And what about a, infertile heterosexual couples? Right. You know, right. we know that they're not going to procreate but right. they can still get married. And Ruth Bader Ginsburg had a great moment um, in Obergefell um, at the argument for the uh, marriage equality case uh, in April where she said, do we let 70 year olds marry? <laughs> <laughs> Are they procreating? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, she's so, um, she's awesome. she got right there, so. Well, she's just excited because Natalie Portman will be playing her. <laughs> <laughs> She's feeling youthful all of a sudden. It's like, and you think so, Natalie Portman, it's me. Ben, can I riff off of one of your questions? Please Ask riff. Deborah, uh, a question? Professors don't talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> Riffing. We've already established that I'm not a. I mean, he's a professor and he's wearing a purple suit. There he's you go. Odd. Good it's one, Deborah. Fantastic. <laughs> um, I was wondering about the kid thing, because I know you're a, a mom from your Twitter yeah. feed. I'm a dad, and my husband and I have two kids. Um, I was wondering if you felt like Will and Grace had to end before kids arrived in the scene, because in the finale, hmm. when they're getting together, right, they both have children, right? right. But that's sort of the outro for the show. Right. But do you think that it would have been possible at that time to put gay people near kids and not have them I think it, I think toxic? it would have been very hard. Yeah. I think, I think more importantly, even to the very end, people still had this fantasy that Grace and Will would somehow end up together forever. Wow. And <laughs> it's true. And so, you know, for either one of them to have a child with someone else is a betrayal. Mm. And I think that, you know, it was decided we, we really can't do that. Mm -hmm. It's funny, I wonder what the statement is about that, that wish, that aspiration, right? Because I'm not sure it means that people are saying, can we just, maybe Will isn't gay after all and that he sees this through, through grace some way. Instead of saying, the better answer is to say, the friendship transcends the sex, yeah. right? That what's really powerful about this was a relationship, which is what people should be thinking about when they're getting married, right? right? The, the, the uniqueness and the beauty of the, of the bond, mm -hmm. which so clearly Will and Grace had. Mm -hmm. um, Kenji, and we're going to get some questions from the audience, dignity comes up a lot in your book, right. and it comes, a lot, comes up a lot in the testimony. And this is an important idea because what some of the things I've told my law students for many years is, well, you know, dignity doesn't get, it's one of those, the most underrated idea in terms of what, what how people get harmed. Yeah. You know, the, the, the loss of dignity, the sense of humiliation, right? We, 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 we discount how powerful that is, unless it's a black eye. Black eye, everyone gets involved. But you humiliate, you strip someone of their dignity, you ruin them for life and yet the legal system has no answer for that. Interestingly, in this case, it did. It did seem like Judge Walker was interested in the testimony related to humiliation and dignity. Yes, and again, um, I think that the lawyers get uh, a lot of credit here for the way they structured the case because they had the plaintiffs talking about this. And one of the arguments that the other side brought was California has been, Chuck Cooper, who is actually a really wonderful man, argued for the proponent, so this is not a slam on him. But he said at one point, California has been extremely generous in what it's given to same-sex couples. And I wince every time I read it because I just think like, you know, as Ted Olson said, you know, citizens should not have to go begging right, for their constitutional rights. So to say that California has given all the material benefits of marriage and is only withholding the word marriage. And right? it implies worthiness. Exactly, mm. exactly. And, that, and that I, one group is worthy of the, the benefits and the name of marriage and another group is not worthy, which, you know, it just makes every one of us just go, oh. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the way I try to try to think about it and to try and, because um, I, I think that visceral response is so, so beautiful and so important, but like if you're talking to somebody who's like not sympathetic, 
the way that I like to think about it is like, not through a civil rights lens, but through like a intellectual property lens of <laughs> saying like, let's think about this as like trademark law, right? So if you say like, you know, I can use this trademark, but Dahlia can't, you know, why am I excluding her? It's either because her use of my brand will confuse the brand, or alternatively, it will tarnish the brand, right? So if you're saying that letting gays into right. marriage is gonna tarnish marriage or deinstitutionalize it, which is the argument that's made, what exactly are you saying about that group of individuals that they're going to lower the esteem or the veneration that people have for the institution? Like, why wouldn't allowing these individuals into uh, marriage like burnish the reputation of marriage rather than tarnish it? And hearing you say that, one clearly says, and that's why this issue deserves heightened scrutiny. Right? Because, yeah. right? Because that is, a, that is a, an incredible indictment. Yeah, and, and for those of you in the audience who, who, are, who are fortunate enough not to be lawyers, uh, heightened scrutiny is this uh, level of judicial protection that's given to classifications like race, national origin, or gender, uh, has not been granted to sexual orientation yet. And so that was what the Ryan Kendall testimony about immutability went to, because when a new group asks for heightened scrutiny, that special protection from the court, immutability is one of the things that it at least ostensibly has to establish. I want to say that you almost blew it for us, Deborah, because uh, another thing. Oh my <laughs> God! <laughs> Deborah, you know the, the the show is in the book, and it, it is was in, in the book. It's in the book. The show surfaces repeated. The show was in the book for a reason, which is that it surfaces repeatedly in the trial, and that was the other question I had for you. Of, were you aware of that? <laughs> no, I all? wasn't. That's that's amazing. But you need to it, send those bucks. But it's actually it's right. in the trial for the wrong reason. Yeah, it's, right. it's actually. Oh, tell me. Yeah, it's actually fascinating because. This is, is it like quail, right? just ruining the, you know? No, no. <laughs> no, <laughs> In no. the best way. It's, it's, it's really a, it's, it's actually a really beautiful moment. So I hope you'll find this um, um, powerful. Um, so one of the things that you have to show um, to get heightened scrutiny, which mm -hmm. is a kind of Willy Wonka gold ticket of constitutional right. law, is to show that you're politically powerless. So that you can't get. Your, the results that you want through the ordinary democratic process. And so therefore you need to be protected by the courts. And what the other side said was, how can you say that gay people are politically powerless when there's will and grace? <laughs> Literally, page 480 of the transcript, <laughs> right? Uh, David Thompson for the proponents of Prop 8 says, will and grace was an, I'm quoting here, will and grace was an immensely successful show, was it not? And George Chauncey, the LGBT historian, has to agree and says, yes, The Will and Grace was an immensely powerful show. And later on, the political powerlessness witness for the plaintiffs has to come on and say, not every gay man is Will. Like, not every gay man is living <laughs> oh. in an apartment like the one that we just saw in the clip with Nobody's the Nobody's living in an apartment like that apartment. <laughs> <laughs> and so Gary Segura, the Stanford professor, actually has to take the stand to testify that not every gay person is living in an apartment like the one that we just saw. Wow. And so this whole debate about, I, I, so I, I, you know, this, I, I didn't, just so it, what I said earlier did not sound sort of empty, I really want to say that the imprint of the show cannot be underestimated. And in these big civil rights trials, it is like a meme that one side uses in order to show that gay people shouldn't have rights, mm -hmm. and then the other side has to testify in a really specific way about particular episodes of the show, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I wish I'd been that lawyer. I was gonna say, uh, <laughs> I was gonna say like <laughs> um, In order to beat it back. So the success of Will and Grace was used to show that gays were politically powerful enough, I mean, ultimately they didn't succeed, but Deborah, you almost blew it for me. <laughs> you know what? Lawyers can just turn anything around. I know. I know. There's that episode where yeah, you <laughs> use a lot of legal terms in an arbitration dispute. Remember this? <laughs> yes. and, then, and then the arbitrator says, you know, um, you've used a lot of legal <laughs> words, but not a single one of them correctly. <laughs> that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Not also. Not not all gay men would know Deborah Messing. Right. Right. This is the whole I don't know life. about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, not it's not just the apartment, it's the experience of Will and Grace that most people don't have. Uh, let's take this from the audience. What's the next big fight within the broad scope of LGBT rights? And how does media representation in its current state propel and or halt progress? What do you think, Dahlia? Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear what Kenji here, but I, I, I 
thinks, but I, I suspect it's these religious freedom. It seems to me that that you know the folks who don't want to bake cakes and who don't want to arrange flat. I'm, you know, these people really, really are making strong claims that has a lot of resonance and a lot of salience in the states. We're seeing these rifras enacted in Indiana. You know, rifras that would protect that, and so it seems to me that. Um, this fight is going to morph, I think, very quickly into a fight about the religious rights of people who do not support, don't want to serve pizzas to, do not want to um, officiate weddings. We heard a lot of talk about that uh, at, at Obergefell. And so I think it's going to turn into a, a, a real uh, knockdown drag out that is going to pit the same way we saw religious freedom pitted against reproductive freedom in Hobby Lobby last year. I think that's where this is going to torque into that, but I'm curious if you agree. Yeah, so I, I think there are two things, and I, I definitely agree with that as, as one of the two things. And uh, I loved what you said earlier about uh, how the Supreme Court gave its imprimatur to uh, the individuals who said, oh, we're in so intimidated because, you know, the opponents of Prop 8, you know, vandalized our signs and, um, you know, the persecuted us on the basis of religion. Uh, John Davidson, who's a lawyer for Lambda Legal, I think put it best when he says, this is a religious majority, right, right voting away the constitutional rights of a minority. So when they cry persecution, it's kind of a, you hit my fist <laughs> when I punched your face argument. <laughs> is the way he puts right, it? Right. right. So I think we're going to see more and more of that, right, as, as marriage equality progresses. And so I think that that's one thing. The other thing that I think is that we're going to see a lot more with transgender issues. And I think that's where the media can really, really help. Yeah. You know, so shows like Transparent yeah. or Courageous Individuals like Bruce Jenner are coming forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, self-identifying as transgender is going to be the next frontier where we really need the media representation in order to fill in the pockets of, of ignorance or misunderstanding that still exist. I'm afraid our evening is coming to an end. Before we say goodbye to Deborah, Kenji, and Dahlia, uh, a couple of things. First of all, if you're getting CLE credit, I think you have to sign out at some place. So please don't leave without signing out. Um, uh, and also, uh, you know, as you know, the Forum on Law, Culture, and Society has lots of programs here at the, uh, here at the 92nd Street Y. And of course, at NYU Law School, we have our Folks Film Festival uh, gearing up for the fall. And what I do every year, what I do every year, and you remember, if you came to our film festival last year, it was just we had these really, this is post-screening conversations with interesting people after film. So we had at the Y, for instance, we had um, Justice Breyer talking about the man who shot Liberty Valance. Um, and so we had, one year we had uh, Justice Sotomayor talking about 12 Angry Men. And we've had, we had Paul Volcker talking about Too Big to Fail. So we had Oliver Stone for Wall Street. So we have a whole new lineup, but I don't, I always, every year, just at our last event before we shut down, I give away one film, and then I won't, I may, I won't let you know anyone, any others until September 1st. Aaron, our executive producer, we just don't. We, we keep it under wraps. But one of them, I'm not sure exactly the date, but it's in October, here at the 92nd Street Y. We have um, Bonfire of the Vanities oh. uh, with Tom Wolfe and Preet Bharara, uh, the United States Attorney for the, for the Southern District of New York. So that's one film, in there, and that's not even one of the good ones. So, <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned. Keep looking at our website. I really want to thank Deborah Messing, Kenji Yoshino, and uh, Dahlia Lithwick. Thank you all so much for coming for Trials and Errors.